We are going to be starting the session. I'm normally not very good grabbing people's attention. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so welcome to the <clears throat> after lunch session in the last day. So this is probably one of the most difficult ones. We are going to be talking about uh, what's next in the HIS2. I feel tiny behind this screen, so I'm going to be over here if that's okay for Grant. And um, <clears throat> so let's, normally in this session we talk about the roadmap, right? But I want to start saying that the roadmap is an ongoing process in the sense that it's not something that we start and finish every year, even, even though we have a release process. The roadmap is like a train that never stops and we keep adding things to it. So the roadmap has previous inputs that we are still working on because we cannot solve them in one release cycle. It has technical priorities that we have to keep on adding and maintaining even though no one asks for them normally. There are strategic decisions that we also have to make in terms of product, like where do each component or the whole DHIS2 has to be <clears throat> addressing or looking at. We also have previous inputs. You know that we have a lot of pending things that are not prioritized. Maybe you don't ask for them every year, but it doesn't mean that we are not going to make them. So we also look at that. I'm going to try this. We also look at that. And then we have new requests, of course. And that's where, that's like the, the, those are the ones that we see every year, right? Like new inputs, new requests, the voting and, and all of that. Today, we are going to talk about that, the new ones, and then uh, introduce you to something that we normally do. We don't normally do in this session, which is the strategic decisions that are actually shaping um, the roadmap from a maybe more a top-down strategy. So let's talk about new requests. Um, it's not new that what we aim every year, year after year with every version is to support the countries. That's normally the main um, target that we have. Of course, also the organizations, etc. But at the end of the day, we listen to the countries through the his groups. That's the biggest thing. And I think you all know that um, we do have ranking processes internally that help us uh, identify priorities, etc., for the final roadmap. And then we listen from you, from the broader community, through JIRA, through the COP, through projects, through emails. Like We have a lot of inputs. But that one is kind of more unstructured, I would say. But this year, we did something differently. We wanted to test how would be a voting process with the community. And I think we all want to say thank you because we had a lot of participation and, and I think many uh, groups and organizations organized a lot for voting, for contributing. That was, that was very nice. And um, of course, we still have JIRA and, uh, and the community. We also look at that. But it was kind of a test uh, to see, okay, let's see how things are. If we ask the broader community, would it be very different or not, or we were kind of testing the waters there without really knowing uh, what would come up. The results were really nice, I, I have to say. This is very small, and I am not going to go through all of it, but the slides are shared. And of course, everything is in the tool that we used. But uh, just to tell you what happened uh, behind the curtains, we also had the internal ranking with the his groups. And this is the top 20 requests that we get, like the more, the, the more popular ones, from the HISP groups. And if we compare it with the results from the community, 14 out of the 20 are shared. We were very happy about this. And I mean, it's not surprising, right? Because at the end of the day, the use cases are the same. We are all working or trying to, to, to support the same challenges and use cases and problems. But still, there was a bit of a um, risk. So 14 out of the 20, top 20 from the HISP, 14 in the top, top 20 from the community matched, which is super good news. It's making our life a bit easier. 
And then the six remaining from the community were also important for the HISPs, with one exception up there. But I mean, what we always have exceptions, right? So it's only one. So <clears throat> this was a very, very good starting point. From here, we had like 26 top priorities to look at, in addition to everything that I mentioned uh, in the first slide. So what did we do? We made an impact and level of effort assessment because I think it's not news uh, to you that we get very different requests. We can get a one-line request that is three years of work touching all groups, data model, analytics engine and everything. And then we can get a similar one-line request that is one button somewhere to make things easier. And the level of effort and the impact is very different. But for us, these are two entries in this list that you saw before. So it's a bit difficult to prioritize and then work with that. So this year we were like, okay, let's get all together and assess the impact that every specific request will, would have and the level of effort. So we got the core team all together. And when I mean all is all, we got the implementation team, health, LMIS, education domains, and product managers to assess what would be the impact of this feature if it was implemented from my perspective, right? From a health perspective, from an Android perspective, from a tracker perspective, for LMIS. And then we also had the engineering team in the room trying to make a very difficult high level assessment of a level of effort. Of course, we don't have details and some things are very abstract, but we were just aiming for days, weeks, months, years. So we kind of uh, did that. And then the purpose was to see, right? How, how would this look if we compare impact versus effort? Ideally, we want a lot of high impact things and we will really not pay a lot of attention to the low impact, high effort things. And then here is where we have to sit and talk. So if we represent here the results from the 26 top uh, requests that were made, surprise, they are all where we have to sit and think, right? We either have high impact and high effort or low impact and low effort. So what is, <laughs> what is tricky here is that we can do maybe one or two of the high impact ones. We, we cannot do more, so we have to be selective. I have made this slide like three times, so if I made a mistake with the labels, you can tell me later, but I think you get the idea. Um, so here is where we were like, okay, we have to be strategic here. And it's not that we were not, we have the, the strategy of the HISP center, etc. But this year was like, okay, let's make explicit effort on having the selection that we make here. And that's where we are today. We are <clears throat> not today, like right now, right now I'm here talking to you, but we are in the process of reconciling the strategies that we are that we are going to so the high level strategies or prior the high level priorities for the platform with, so that's a top-down perspective, with the bottom-up requests that we had. And we are trying to map them. I mean, we are going to map them and based on that, build a roadmap. So yes, we are still building the roadmap. That's why it wasn't shared. But as I started saying, it's not that we are sitting idle. We have a lot of work that we know and we know some things have to be done. So we are already working on the next version, but the little details are being refined now. So we have six high level priorities and they touch the different aspects, areas, products of the HIS2. So we are going to have the different product managers explaining us what do we mean with this. I think it's very easy then later to connect actually with the requests that we got. But we want to keep the discussion at this level today to share with you um, yeah, those priorities that you will see reflected in our long term uh, roadmap probably after summer. So I think I'm going to stop here and call Scott. All right. If you want to use the fancy setup. First priority. Is this like a panel where we just going to sit down? Yeah, you can. No, I don't want to no. stay up here. Okay. You can stay. You're taller than me. You can be Oh, here. just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, so I'm gonna take us to one of the first strategic priorities and kind of talk a little bit about how we're starting to imagine this gets reflected back into the platform uh, and the roadmap. So really, you know, DHS2, we've been around for a while and we're kind of starting to have, um, to suffer from our own success a little bit. We have been really good as a DHS2 community at making more DHS2. What we have been less good at is making sure that all of these DHIS2 instances that we've been making for all of these programs, for these different projects, um, speak to each other. And that we get all the data into one place. And that at the end of the day, public health experts, program managers, ministries of health, what they need is most of their data to be in one place. They're from all of their different programs and projects and they want to do triangulated analytics and um and uh yeah and uh just build their informed decisions off of as much different data sources as they can possibly have now our ability to make more dhs2 instances again has been a strength and it was really quite a testament during the covid uh pandemic when we were able to spin up so many different covid specific databases and and, uh, and, and, and really have a very large impact there. But again, at the end of the day, we're starting to suffer from this a little bit by having everything very fragmented within the DHIS2 ecosystem. When I say ecosystem, I mean within each country, even within each implementation, having a very fragmented number of DHIS2 instances and having also a lot of data that is sitting outside of DHIS2, maybe in other data capture tools, um, even just Excel spreadsheets. Um, this situation that we find ourselves in with very fragmented landscape of DHIS2 instances in many countries has actually opened us up to be quite vulnerable to some commercial entities that have, um, that are able to take advantage of the situation a bit. And I think that we need to be mindful that some of these commercial entities are not thinking about sustainability. They're not thinking about um, long-term support to ministries, but they are definitely appreciating that we have a very we have a fragmentation problem within the DHIS2 community, and they are able to build complex, fairly bespoke integration layers and analytics on top of that, right? Um, and they are starting to be relatively successful at this, and we're seeing even now some issues starting to develop around the world about their being very, very expensive to maintain, them being very, very complex, the ministries not being able to own these bespoke interoperability and integration layers, um, and uh, it kind of undermining the broader ethos of what DHIS2 is and what we're all here to do, right? So what are we gonna do? There's quite a lot of things that we're going to do. We're going to update our implementation guidance. We're going to do a lot of capacity uh, uh, building, uh, training to various his groups, to ministries. But we also have to uh, respond with the technology as well. We have to appreciate that fragmentation in many countries is going to be the norm, not the exception. It is very hard to unscramble the egg once you've scrambled it. So it makes a very complex scenario and complex situations typically require relatively complex solutions. What we're going to do is some of the leading solutions that we've seen to, for this are pulling data into other analytics source uh, tools from various sources and then figuring out how do we bring that back into DHIS2. One of the things that we're exploring for the analytics roadmap is something we're tentatively calling uh, dashboard types. And these dashboard types, we've done a bit of specking, we've done some investigation. These dashboard types should hopefully enable us to bring in analytics from other sources, say, um, for example, uh, uh, Superset, or maybe even some of the uh, dashboard apps that have been made already existing in the DHIS2 ecosystem directly onto the standard DHIS2 dashboard. So you can see a bit of a picture there as a proof of concept. Oh, sorry. Oh, you guys have been looking at the wrong thing the whole time. <laughs> I thought you were just building up. Yeah, I thought you were doing a nice intro. I was waiting for you to 
for the big reveal. Here's the picture. Yeah. And so, yeah. Well, and I, you know, we have to give some credit. This is this is uh, coming through a, a partnership with uh, with uh, uh, BAO Systems and understanding how they're addressing this problem and figuring out how their solution can be uh, produced more generically, made more available uh, to to all DHIS2 users. So it's something that we're exploring, uh, but we do see this uh, fragmentation as a serious problem. We do appreciate that there are many commercial entities trying to. Uh, take advantage of this situation, and we as a DHIS2 community need to respond. If you are ever curious about these commercial entities that I'm talking about that may be talking to you or working with uh, ministries, and you're not sure are they a good faith actor within the DHIS2 community, please do come and talk to us, and we're very happy, we're very happy to help you kind of appreciate the broader picture of, uh, of who some of these folks are and if you can rely on them or not, from our experience. Okay. There's a little bit of rabble over here. I'm just going to ignore it. All right. The other thing and that you saw on, um, in Marta's diagram is there is a very large demand for improved tracker analytics. There's a lot of symptoms that you're kind of dealing with right now because you do not have adequate tracker analytics. For example, you're making thousands of program indicators to do relatively basic aggregations of tracker data, right? This is a symptom of not having the proper analytics that you require. Now, we have stretched the event reports and event visualizer app as far as those poor apps are going to be able to go. We are not going to be able to get you the aggregations, the tracked entity aggregations, the event, the enrollment aggregations that you're currently having to do in program indicators into those apps. We can't, make, we can't add any more to those apps. So what we're planning on doing is um, building a new combined event reports and event visualizer application that will give you the pivot tables and the various chart types that are appropriate for tracker data um, and uh, uh, allow you to produce those aggregations that you're, more resorting, you're uh, resorting to mostly program indicators to do now. This is going to take a while. This is a, going to be a lot of work. So we're not committing to timelines, but we are telling you that this is going to be a, a major focus. And you can actually see from the mock-ups here uh, that we started to do a lot of the initial design. The back-end team is also very much hard at work already investigating and implementing new performance strategies because, of course, as we talk about tracker aggregation, we have to talk about performance. We have got to improve performance, um, and we are introducing new technologies on the back-end that will hopefully should dramatically improve performance to facilitate these kinds of uh, analytics going forward. I was supposed to take 10 minutes to do it. Okay, that's it from me. Thanks. All right, so just making sure we're on the right slide. The microphone's on. Is it? How about now? All right. Um, yeah, so Scott already started touching on uh, some of those tracker priorities, but I wanted to start out just by highlighting what we know at this point about how tracker is used and how that's driving the strategy. So again, over the last four or five years, we've seen massive uptake of tracker. Um, and we're looking specifically only at those that we have some information on based from the HIST network partnerships, uh, the, the ministries of health that we have connections to. We know that there are over 90 countries and they're among those 90 countries, there's over a thousand government owned programs that are in tracker. Uh, there's much more going on in the NGO space and there's many more going on in countries that we're not even aware of. But this is at least what we do know. And we've also done from some of our survey work to see that the, the major use cases the make up the majority of those implementations are around specific health registries and around case surveillance, disease surveillance. Uh, these are the, the major areas where we have 
millions of users. Uh, so this in in the tracker world, users are are ten times, a hundred times more than what it would be in the aggregate world. You spin up one national instance for a, a malaria registry, and it's going to potentially have ten thousand users in just one one simple program. Um, so for us, that means there's a lot of focus that we want to really put on enabling those use cases, making them work better. The, the first thing that we know is challenging is about feeding that registry data where it belongs eventually, which is the HMIS. It's the source data for many of the national indicators. It's something that we have always had as the goal to do, and we know it's not easy enough. The tracker to aggregate pathway can be challenging, especially in the kind of fragmented uh, implementations that Scott was referencing. It's difficult from instance to instance. It's difficult to aggregate and import. It's difficult to put them in the right place. We have had many different attempts at technologies to try to address this that have kind of helped us get past a, a, a really quick adoption period but there's more that we need to do to make this seamless. The, the entire promise of having individual data in DHIS2 is so that it can be source data for the aggregate side. So you'll see us spending a lot of effort on this, improving the tooling, the guidance, the documentation. And this includes from our side, what we're calling initiatives during this time period, which is where we are combining the implementation team, the research team, the engineering team, working with the HISP teams on a specific problem. And so we'll be going to multiple countries dealing with their challenges in, in integrating their own DHS2 data. Uh, another benefit to this will be that the tooling, of course, is meant to be as generic as possible. And that will also be something that we would be able to apply to integrations with other systems, just generically using the tracker data model as the ability to, to bring in data from other sources. So of course, Tracker isn't everything, it's not covering everybody's individual data, but still much of the data living in other systems is the source data for the HMIS, and we really want to be facilitating that. So there's going to be a lot of effort in those areas. We know, particularly with countries that are rolling out these very massive uh, Tracker programs, they're not all able to do direct data entry at the point of data generation, at the point of care, wherever the thing is happening. A lot of this is still paper first and then entered individually into Tracker. And the user interface is not good for this. It's not good enough. It's not very quick. We know from the COVID experience, just many months of backlogs worth of paper data that needs to get digitized before it can actually be properly analyzed and used. So we really want to put an emphasis on this experience, on the ability to be able to do quicker data entry from secondary data entry sources, hopefully making the life a lot easier for many of the poor data clerks out there and the, the nurses, midwives that are at the lowest levels that need to sit down at the end of the week and digitize everything that they've done during the week. So we're really going to try to improve the entire user experience and workflow. This means things like a lot of bulk actions. It means being able to do data entry in list format, being able to edit, uh, for example, within working lists. There are a number of ways that we're going to try to tackle this to make it easier. And we want to really speed up the process to get that from paper into digitized form much quicker than it currently is. And then Scott spent a fair amount of time talking about this. Tracker analytics has always lagged behind because, of course, aggregate was the starting use case for DHS2. It was also the predominant use case for many years. Uh, everybody had an aggregate instance, and then some had tracker. So there's been, rightfully, the resources dedicated to the aggregate side of data analytics. But at this point, we're lagging way behind. There's much more that people want to be able to do with their individual data than we have the ability to do. So Scott mentioned some of the ways that uh, we're going to try to tackle that on the analytics front. Part of it is truly a performance question as well, just making sure that the tools that we already have are actually more performant and we can make sure to run the kinds of queries and analysis that you want. And then a third aspect of this that isn't new analytics and isn't speeding up is the ability to utilize external analytics more easily. There's been a lot of innovation in this community and crowd using 
R, using Stata, using other statistical analysis for your individual level data. There have been apps made. There have been a lot of uh, attention paid to that. And we want to improve that experience. Part of that is the extensibility approach. Part of it is our export and import tools. So trying to do a lot more to make it so that you can do the analytics that you need to where you need to, but that the HMIS won't lose out on it. The DHS2 will continue to be the uh, source for the national programs. So those are the areas where we're going to be focusing a lot. And as I said, it's not just development, it's as a core team, we're going to be working with a lot of your countries and a lot of your programs. If these are areas that you have as specific pain points or priorities of your own, reach out. We really want to be able to identify some of the strongest cases to learn from and to make sure that we build solutions that actually work. So with that, I think I will turn it over to Austin. You guessed it. I'm here to talk about extensibility. Um, extensibility is one of the key strategic areas that we want to focus on as well in supporting all of you and the ecosystem of, of contributors that are out there, both in terms of contributing code to uh, DHIS2 core, but also building extensions, building applications, customizing and adapting to the local context, which we know is, is critically necessary for making something that's actually usable in the field. Um, some of the main goals of the extensibility are to reduce the need to fork DHS2, either an app or the core itself, right? This is something that has been possible to do for a long time. There are many of you probably who maintain forks and probably realize how difficult that can be to take the, the upstream changes that are in DHS2 core itself or in the application, make sure you're staying up to date. This ends up with a lot of people on very old versions with security issues, lots of things like that, as well as not being able to take advantage of the, the continuous improvements that we're making throughout the platform. So one of the main goals of building a, a framework for extensibility is to make it easy to customize and adapt to the local needs without needing to uh, basically create a copy of what you already have or what we already have. The second part is to make it easy for developers to build, maintain, and share their extensions and their innovations, right? So this is something that the, the platform has been doing for some time now in order to try to make it as low cost and low effort as possible to build something that you can then share with the community, you can maintain over time, so it's not gonna be something that you build and then it breaks uh, three months later. Uh, and to be able to, sh to share that with other people that are going to implement and use those extensions in, in different countries. So this creates an ecosystem of different contributors to be able to develop the suite of applications that we all use and we call DHS2. Even though DHS2 is just the foundation of that, there's many more applications and extensions built on top of it. And lastly, this is also very critical for our own pace of innovation as we build applications uh, with as the DHS2 core team. As we talked about, continuous release allows us to, while we are ma making sure that the core itself is very stable, we're maybe slowing down the release cycle to a, to a year, for example, uh, we can continually improve and, and build the, the pace of the changes that we make to applications and make sure that we can get bug fixes and new features out to you as quickly as possible. So I just have a couple uh, ways we're going to go about this. The first uh, mentioned already some new extension points that we have in version 41. We're gonna continue to build and, and formalize and, and kind of build, de define the APIs for new extension points within DHIS2 so that you can build smaller and smaller pieces to customize just the things you need. So we talked about plugins in the capture application. We have also applications in, uh, in the web. We have applications in Android using the SDK. We have plugins on the dashboard that have been around for a long time. Uh, there's also uh, extension points or ways to do things on the server side to extend the business logic of the API to be able to persist data over time. Uh, and we'll be continually adding more of these to make more types of extensions possible. 
and, and particularly to be able to combine these different extension points into a, uh, a full featured extension that takes advantage of all these different places that you might need a, a plugin in the capture app, a plugin on the dashboard, an application, maybe an Android application, a custom namespace in the data store, lots of things like that. And we'll be adding more of these. And the second piece of work that we're going to embark on is to build reference implementations for some types of extensions that we know people want to use. This is not necessarily to be the only way that you in interact with a civil registry, but to give people an idea of how they could build that, right? So, so to give them a starting point, a template, and then they can adapt it to their local needs uh, and use it in the extension points that we develop. So there are a lot of uh, ways that we can, um, or different types of use cases that we can build reference implementations for. We have been doing this already in the integration team with Fire, for example, in a number of cases. Um, there's other ways where we can uh, interact with different terminology services, uh, WHO drug, ICD-11, those types of things. Uh, there's already an example that was shown in the developer uh, meetup or developer session earlier today about interacting with a civil registry. Uh, a lot of these are, are very common use cases, but they're also very slightly different in each implementation. So we want to make it easy for you to get started and then to adapt that to your local needs. And then the last piece of work is, is uh, continuing to support the community of contributors that are all of you. That's uh, developers, that's also implementers and users of the extensions that those developers are making, allowing those developers not only to, build, to contribute uh, to a, a, an ecosystem or a, a library of applications that everyone can use, but also to start to contribute to, to some of the core things that we're doing as well as we break that up into smaller and smaller pieces as well. Um, I was uh, really impressed with the developer uh, session today because this isn't uh, typically a conference that, that has a lot of sessions that are targeted to developers, but the room was full. And there are so many more people out there that were online in that session as well. I think the, the, uh, the community is really growing and we wanna support that community to support all of you and to build something that we can all share in the, the innovations that are being made. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Thank you very much. Do I have a green light? All right, good afternoon. Um, all right, the next initiative I'm gonna talk about is supporting countries to upgrade. So we know that upgrading's hard. We know that there's a lot to it, um, but we're looking at having a really focused initiative on how we can help get countries more up to date. Um, so, so this involves a lot of things. This isn't just a software solution. This isn't something that we can change in the software that's instantly gonna make it um, easy to upgrade and by one click. But we also know that it's not necessarily a gap in understanding of, of how to upgrade. Bob and, Bob and the team have a 12-step plan. We can tell people how to upgrade that's quite... <laughs> Is it 12? <laughs> 11. <laughs> There's a plan, but, but just knowing the plan's not quite enough. It's how do, how do we implement it? How do we go about identifying why people aren't implementing it? And so that's about, really, we're gonna be looking at how we work with you, with countries, with HISPs, to identify those blockers. Where are they? What, how are they the same for other, some countries? How are they different to other countries? And how do we go about addressing them and getting them um, fixed to get up to, up to date? Um, so the other, th the other part of this is, is, is building uh, more trust in the releases. So we're looking at um, releasing more stable platforms. Going to the annual uh, release cycle means that you've got three years to be on a current release instead of just 18 months. So we've got a lot longer that you can be on, on a stable release. Uh, we're also looking at improving our base testing so that we have got more tests involved that you'll have a little bit more confidence in that, that first dot zero release. Um, so, you know, we know that that's hard as well. That takes time. I think the, the quote I heard yesterday, I think it was a UNESCO representative said, um, what is it, trust comes walking but leaves running. So <laughs> it is going to take a little while to build that back up to get the confidence that people can, can upgrade straight to, to a dot zero release. But a really important part of, of building that is also the, um, is the beta testing program that we've got. So we've got some countries involved. It had been a closed uh, practice before, but we're opening it up. So we're going to have, so if, if you're interested, please let us know. And the more real world examples that we have of testing. So we've got 
real um, countries with real data, real databases. We're finding bugs before we release. The more of that we can do, the more confident we'll have, confidence we'll have that when we come to release, it's, it's uh, a fully stable version. So yeah, so we'll be working on you with this, so keep, keep, keep posted and let us know. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the strategic support for domains. So we do know DHS2 is used for a lot more than health. We have got lots of domains going, we've got education, logistics, and of course climate is the big new area. Um, we will continue to expand on these extra domains, um, and we're looking at ways that we can, we can better use the software support. That's not just building new functionality into core, it's how do we support um, the, the extensibility and the developer network to help build solutions to this. It's looking at things like the Seamus app that's being built out of Mozambique. How do we better integrate support within the core system and within our core, um, core teams, but still supporting the development that's coming from external um, areas. So we're looking to you know, maximize the functionality without necessarily relying on just the changes coming to core. Um, with, the, with the climate, I'm sure you'll hear more about that later today, but we, we are looking for you know, partners from a, a technical point of view and from a, from a, a community point of view uh, to grow that. And health and climate is a new domain. This is something that's, there's not a lot of people out there that are doing this already, so it's emerging. So we're looking at how we can understand how this is evolving and, and be involved um, from the start. So I think with that, it's back to Marta. And uh, <clears throat> this is the last one. But before that, I want to give a heads up to Max that we might finish earlier because my colleagues have been quick. <laughs> and I don't think I can talk for 12 minutes about this. <laughs> so we can see if we do questions or, or what do we do. But um, so yes, user experience is the last uh, strategic area where we want to focus on. Is historically maybe the one that we have Historically, I mean like long-term history, not really focusing on making the screens better and the interaction with the user. But um, design is many in many occasions like overlooked. In, it's like, it's not about making things pretty. Some people understand it as making things pretty, but it's not only that. User experience starts there. User acceptance starts there. Data quality also starts there. You can avoid mistakes with a good design. So we want to improve, um, keep improving. Many efforts have been made in the last years on this area, still a focus. We want to keep working on that. So any activity related to the user-facing part of the HIS2 is going to be addressed by this initiative. It also affects, like, there are a few specific goals that, that, uh, that we have. One is very, very particularly connected to the strategy that Mike was mentioning before, like none of these uh, areas are isolated, right? They all touch in different levels. So secondary data entry is something that, of course, is doable, but can be better. So that's something we are going to be addressing from, from that uh, perspective, but also the user flow, flexible workflows. That's a really big challenge. And maybe that's one challenge that we have to address with an extensibility lens. So connecting now with Austin's, uh, maybe we, we cannot do everything within the HIS2, but, but we know different user flows are required and, and we, we have been receiving requests for the need to give different user experiences, give different flows uh, for different use cases. We can do some, but not all. We are gonna be focusing on that as well. And then last, translations. So Phil, that was here before we talked over lunch. But uh, translations, I mean, that's everything, right? And it's been there uh, for a long, long time. Yes, you can translate everything. But sometimes processes can be improved. Also the way in which translations are updated, it could be more flexible. This can also talk extensibility at some point. So just saying, we want to improve also these mechanisms of translation, make them more agile, more easy to integrate, easy to translate. So all those areas are going to be targeted from a user experience uh, perspective. And this is the last of the six 
uh, strategic priorities that we are going to be looking at. And it doesn't mean anything out of these ones will not be made. Remember, we have a lot of low effort things here. You can look at those as well. But the roadmap is going to be built looking at this and trying to have a history to tell around this, uh, these areas. So I'm going to move to my last slide. Uh, just to say thank you. We were very, very happy and surprised with the response on the voting process uh, for the for the roadmap. It's really it really helps us. Like we know from the community, etc. But quantifying sometimes is good, um, and it was in this case. It's it's a really good proxy for us, and we think we can, or we want to continue working on on those lines. So we are now. As you know, we used a new tool, Discovery, for the ideas, where you were suggesting ideas, voting ideas. That was kind of a test for us, but we have so far liked it. So we will most likely remain in that discovery world and ideas world for managing the requests and the features. So we will probably move out from Jira features to ideas. And we are planning to be more agile in the way we triage the ideas. So I think. I have heard, at least from uh, some people during this week, that you feel more agility on, on the bugs. Like now the, the backlog is smaller and things are, you see action on the, on the Jira issues when you report a bug. We are aiming for the same uh, from the product side. We want to move requests and inputs to the ideas concept and we are setting up processes to go through it regularly of course, there will be probably an annual roadmap effort, but we, this is a continuous process for you in the projects and for us in the roadmap, as I started saying now almost one hour ago. So thank you very much. Um, I think we are looking forward to, to keep listening, keep improving, and we know the roadmap feels slow. You are a lot of projects, a lot of people. Every new thing might help a few of you, not the others. Whenever it it works. We are very, very happy to listen, very happy to help. Or should I say we are healthy? That's my, my new favorite term. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's it from, from us. And what's next? We will also publish results and everything in that tool, in the discovery tool. But this is all going to get through you through the COP. So don't worry now. And what's the time? How ahead am I? 10 minutes ahead. <laughs>